to do this. I got to do youth ministry for a number of years with Young Life, high school students. And uh, a number of those years were under the direction of my good friend, Joey. And uh, Joey tells a story. I remember him telling me this story one time. We just really needed a word from God. And he's hiking in Colorado. And he's praying, asking God for a word. And out of nowhere, this horse just starts charging right at him, comes right up to him and stops and just nuzzles him. And I take comfort in that story today, knowing that if I fail to bring a word to you all, God can and will use Ray's horse back then. <laughs> Jesus says in Luke that if his disciples stay quiet about him, that even the stones will cry at him. But that's not his, that was not his intention. His intention was to use us. He invites us to be his ministers. He invites us into his ministry. And we see that for the first time in Mark 3 when Jesus calls his 12 disciples. So up until now, this is a pivot point in Jesus' life and in his ministry where he's been preaching to the masses. He's preaching out to the masses. He's preaching, he's teaching, and he's healing people. Preaching about the kingdom of God, that it's near, that it's close, that it's intimate, it's right here. And to repent and believe, and like Nate said, turn and mash the gas, hit the throttle. all over. The crowds came from all over to see Jesus. Some came in real faith. Some came just to be healed. And others showed up to try to shut him down. And it's at this point in his ministry that he calls out to the crowd of people that are following him. He calls 12 guys that they might be with him. And he might send them out to preach. That they'd be with him. And he'd send them out to preach. Um, and it's, uh, we're going to read now the scripture. It's Mark 3, 13 through 19. You can find it in your bulletins. Jesus went up to the mountainside and he called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed the twelve that they might be with him. And he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. And we're going to skip the list for now because trust me, we're going to get into it. But we got a lot to learn from the disciples, their life call that they received is we try to be a church that's healthy and connected up in and out that's up with god in a christ-centered community and out as we strive to bring the kingdom of god to a world that desperately needs it let me pray jesus thank you so much that you invite us into this that you invite us into your ministry that you use broken people like the disciples like myself such a testament to your goodness and how much you love us. God, I pray that nothing that I say will be distracting or confusing in any way to your message so that we might learn the rhythm of being your disciple. Amen. Okay, so now look at your bulletins at that list, at that list of disciples. And how many do you think you could have come home with? How many do you think you could have named before? Before looking at the list. I've been annoying like everybody with this question. Really. And most people come in right around five. I, I, I came in right around five. I've yet to meet anybody that can come home with a whole list. I intentionally didn't ask Nate because I just want to go on believing that he's got this. Yeah, I knew it. Um, but if you're anything like me, your knowledge is some of these guys can be reduced to what you've seen in a stained glass window. Uh, angelic depiction of these guys doing something holy. And it got me wondering, I mean, what are these guys really like? I mean, why don't we know that much about them? So I did some digging on this. There are four lists of the disciples in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. That all start with Peter. We know quite a bit about Peter. Renamed, his original name is Simon. Renamed Peter by Jesus because he's the rock. That's what Peter means. The rock that Jesus was going to build his church on. Shows his steadfastness. Also can allude sometimes to his stubbornness, his hard-headedness. And we see the fullness of Peter's character throughout the New Testament. We get to watch him step out onto the water in faith and walk out onto the water to Jesus and then in a moment of faithlessness watch him start to sink. We watch
bunch of slice off the ear of a Roman soldier. We watch him deny Jesus three times, but then, filled with the Holy Spirit, we watch him deliver the first sermon at Pentecost. We get to see a lot. Peter gets a lot of reps in the New Testament. The rest of them, not so much. We know a little bit about James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Zebedee might have been somebody because they mentioned him a bunch, and John was known to the high priest, so there could have been a connection there. John went on to write, oh, he was the disciple that Jesus loved, that's how he was known. Went on to write the book of John, a couple of epistles, the book of Revelations. But Jesus calls these guys Boanerges, sons of thunder, which in like modern day, that means hotheads, hot tempered. Um, and in Luke 9, when they're walking through a Samaritan village that didn't welcome them real well, they say to Jesus, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? We also watch them jockeying for position at Jesus' right in the field. So these three guys, these are Jesus' inner circle. And already you're starting to see that perfect angelic stained glass window image kind of fade away. And as we go down through the rest of the list, you're going to get a sense of intentional obscurity. Like we really just don't know that much about these guys. Andrew. He was a fisherman like the first three, and he was tight with that, that inner circle, but we don't know much more about him. Philip was likely from Bethsaida, don't know much more about him. Bartholomew was a nickname, means son of Tholome. Real name's Nathaniel. Matthew, we know about Matthew. If you did not get to hear Don's sermon a couple weeks ago, go back and watch it. It was awesome. But it was about Matthew and how his, he was originally named Levi. He was a tax collector. Jesus renames him Matthew after he starts following him. But Don was telling us all about what it meant to be a tax collector, that these guys, they were traitors. I mean, thieves, extorters, they would say, right up there with murderers. And he was a follower of Jesus, and he went on to write the book of Matthew. Thomas, Didymus, he was a twin, ditto. Um, also known as Doubting Thomas, for wanting to see the holes in Jesus' hand and his side. Don't know much more about him. James, son of Elpheus, known as James the Less, or is Micros, means micro, tiny, tiny James. Um, a lot of nicknames in here, which is kind of cool. Um, Thaddeus, uh, it's believed, and a lot of people agree, that his real name was Judas, son of James, and then he went on to write the book of Jude. Um, his uh, nickname is Thaddeus, which means mama's boy. Simon the Zealot, we know nothing about Simon, but the Zealots were uh, a political revolutionary group at the time that were committed to seeing the end of Roman oppression. And they were notorious for keeping daggers in their cloaks to try to pick off Roman soldiers that got away from the rest of the group. So, intense dude. Um, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. All the lists in with Judas and all mentioned that he betrayed Jesus. New Testament really doesn't share that much about these guys' story, who they were, or really what they did particularly to advance the gospel. They're largely unknown. And that's because their purpose as apostles, sent ones, ones sent with a message, was to make Jesus known, not themselves. And they did that. They mashed the gas on what it says is that these were the guys that Jesus wanted. They weren't perfect, but they were the ones that Jesus wanted. And you gotta ask why, and I gotta believe that some of the reason why Jesus picked these guys is that there is no way that you could look at them and say that when they turned the world upside down, that it was of their own power. That was of Jesus and Jesus alone. And they didn't need to be perfect to accomplish Jesus' purposes. In fact, Jesus rather accomplishes his purposes despite their failures and being evil. So when we're looking at this list, we can know that there's nothing that qualifies these guys that doesn't qualify us, that doesn't qualify you, and that the same call that they received is the same rhythm that we're invited into, this rhythm of being with Jesus and being sent. Of being with Jesus and being sent. 
Because we're not called to, to just believe and to come to church. We're called to be with him and to be sent. So we're going to talk about this rhythm today. Being with him and being sent. So doing Young Life, uh, one of my favorite things was to get to sit with a kid when they experienced Jesus for the first time. It was like all the lights in the whole world came on. And they're just blown away. And they can't stop talking about it. They've had this mountaintop experience. But like many new believers, they still really just don't know, like, anything really about Jesus. And it's somewhere between adorable and terrifying when they start talking to their friends about him. Some of you youth, youth ministry people know what I'm talking about. The disciples were called to be with Jesus so he might teach them and then send them out. You gotta spend some time getting to know Jesus first. And you see it with the disciples, and you'll see as we continue through Mark, you'll see this rhythm. I didn't notice it until I was looking for it. You see this rhythm of him sending them out to preach and then coming back to be with him. Sending them out to preach and coming back to experience him. Send him out to preach. This is going to be fun. Come on. Yes. And you see him come back and calm a raging storm. Cast out demons. Go out to preach. Come back. Raise the dead. Feed tons of people with nothing. Go out to preach. Come back. Walk on water. Heal the afflicted. Go out to preach. Come back. Welcome children and heal the ear of a Roman soldier, which you so brilliantly chopped off. <laughs> Always in this rhythm. And if we're not paying attention as disciples of Jesus, we can get out of this rhythm. Or we can tend to favor part of this rhythm. For me, I'm a doer. I'm like, let's get stuff done. Let's go. It's real hard for me to just sit and to be with Jesus and to meditate on his word and to pray and to just be still. It's so hard for me. I tend to burn out real easy and just feel fatigued. It's really important for me to like notice that and come back to be refreshed by God. Steve was up here a few weeks ago. It just really resonated with me when he said during the prayer confession that he felt like he was outpacing Jesus. I don't know if you ever felt like that. Man, I do. And when you feel like that, it's time to check in. It's time to check in on your rhythm. And hopefully you've got some people that you can talk to about that. If you've got a Mark study group or somebody that you can talk to about your rhythm, I'd say these are good questions to ask these people here. What do you need to do to protect your time with Jesus? What are the things that are squeezing out of that memory? And this is important for us because when we talk about being yeah, a church is connected, but being yeah, out, this is not. This is connecting with God. And we need that. And other people need that. This world is like desperate to see the goodness of the kingdom come in their broken places. Other people need that. So it's sweet that we're called not only to be with Jesus, but also to be sent. And to be that light that's bringing that. Other people might find it terrifying. I know I was raised to tell you faith, that's personal. That, that's 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 uh, that's private. Or uh, I mean how hard is it to give up just the control of your life, you know, the life direction. I mean that's too much to ask sometimes. My money, my finances, my time, my plan. I don't know if I can do it. Been there too. But we're called to this. We're called to be with him and to be sent. To be with him and to be sent. So what if we never go? I grew up I grew up farming with my family. And there's this saying that applies way too much. Is that maybe you've heard it. Never use the right tool when the wrong tool is closer. I feel like we live by that on our farm. And I remember it used to be my job to ride around in the back of the tractor and I spent all day hammering out wagon pins with a big old one wrench. Because that's what we had in the toolbox. And I haven't been to the farm in a long time, but I can guarantee you that wrench 
probably never been used to fix a sink, is probably in real rough shape. <laughs> so there's some natural consequences to never being used for the thing that you were intended to be used for. To never get to do the thing that you were made for. You were made for that. You were made to be with it. And, it was, and there are a couple of consequences that I probably my least favorite. There are a lot of them, but two of my least favorite are that it can lead you to feel like you can't be used. That you can't be served. That somehow you're different than the rest of the world. And this doesn't apply to you. And that's just not true. But probably my least favorite, and I think that it's it just makes me sad how much I've heard it or people that feel this way. But it can also make you feel like you're showing up to the church showing up to a church full of people that somehow magically got it all figured out. It's just not true. Everyone is invited to participate in God's story that's not personal stuff. And we can end up feeling like we're not. We gotta check in on this rhythm. Check in with each other on this rhythm. Because even those of us that have been in it for a while, it's easy to get knocked out of it when they different things that happen in your life that you weren't expecting a move, a change in jobs, a, a tragedy, a, a diagnosis, all things that can change what you got going on or the way that God's sending you. So check in with each other on that. Here are a couple of good questions that you could ask. definitely ask Nate <laughs> or kick around in your study group. I don't, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer this, but given the mountain of research material that Nate provided for me, from what I can tell, going to find a demon to try to cast out of somebody will fall into the category of not particularly advisable. But this right here, this might be the best thing that God showed me in all of this study and preparation. And this I hope that we can agree that the spiritual world is real. That it's real on the local level and on the macro level. Local level being the, the demon. Macro level being the overall forces of darkness. And it's the church's job to identify the macro. To resist corrupt ways and not be conformed by them. Cultivating instead godly virtues. Humility, love for one another, commitment to one another, service to God's church. Cultivating communities of virtue is powerful against the darkness. I read that a bunch of times when I said it. Cultivating communities of virtue is powerful against the darkness, and we are definitely called to that. So when we talk about up, in, and out, that's the end part. That's cultivating a Christ-like community 
powerful it is the darkness. <laughs>